ultrasound or MRI? That's a big question. If you follow this lecture, I will try to answer this question at the end. So first of all, let me introduce uh, you my um, work, uh, my workplace, the facilities of the Athletic David Ball, a, a nice place to work. Ultrasound has some strengths. Okay? So uh, this is in Ari Hasso Chile, which is a, a weight lifter here in, this, uh, in a traditional sport we have in Basque Country. So what are the strengths of the ultrasound? It's innocuous. He's affordable. And you can, uh, it's immediate, you can perform this ultrasound in the point of care, just after the injury. So this is very, very useful in terms of sports injuries. It's comfortable for the patient, for the player, and it's guided by patient symptoms. So you can focus in the painful area and you can rule out uh, these false uh, images, these false positive images we will find uh, very, very frequently. Finally, it has a very, very high resolution in the superficial structures, even better than the best MRI. But not as good, not as perfect. There are some, uh, some weaknesses with ultrasound. It has a huge operator dependent, uh, de dependence. So the acquisition of the images are very dependent of the experience of the operator. All, it is true both all, uh, for all the techniques on the in image, but especially for ultrasound. Usually mild injuries, deep structures, and small tendon tears are challenging to see, are difficult to see with ultrasound. And finally, in terms of matur maturity of the scar, the ultrasound is not uh, sensitive enough. It's better the MRI. I love this phrase. We only see what we know. So uh, in, to see an injury, we, we must know how this injury is seen by ultrasound. So, uh, we are going to talk about muscle injuries. Welcome to mskfreak.com, a new way to learn MSK ultrasound. In this website, you will find different contents, chapters in some of the courses, detailed anatomical explanations with amazing high resolution 3D drawings, lectures comparing the anatomy with the ultrasound images. And finally, real-time demos to reassure the concepts. MSK Freak, your website of MSK Ultrasound. And as you know, muscle injury, muscle has two components, the muscular tissue and the connective tissue. We are trying uh, to explain how we can see the injuries in the muscular tissue first. So muscular tissue is seen in with ultrasound, the normal muscular tissue is seen like this hyperechoic background, which are the muscle fibers, with these hyperechoic images, which are the fibrodipose septa, and it's reminiscent of the, for me, a sky with seagulls. Okay? So this is a very uh, kind of image, very characteristic of the muscle in the short axis. When this muscle gets injured, this image, this image changes. And we'll see how this hyperechoic background becomes hyperechoic because of the edema. And how these uh, seagulls, this uh, yeah, fiber adipose septa, then gets blurred, distortion. We, 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 there is a blurring of this septa. And if there is some amount of uh, disruption of the injury, you will see this injury is filled with blood. So there is an hematoma seen less, uh, like an anechoic image. This is an example of a rectus hemolis. You can see here the edema. And we will compare with, in this case with the MRI, and you can see the same edema in both image techniques. As you can see, we can see the edema, the muscle edema, with both techniques very, very, uh, very well. And what about connective tissue? Connective, normal connective tissue usually has a normal thickness, is homogeneous, so uh, all the pattern is the, the same, there's no differences between uh, areas of the tendon, is hyperechoic and has a very good definition. So we can distinguish very, very well the boundaries, the limits of the tendon. It usually has a high anisotropy, very characteristic of the tendons. And is usually tense, well, usually no, it's tense, okay? 
And when this tendon gets affected, the first thing is that it gets, it gets thickened and it loses his uh, homogeneity. There is no more homogeneous if there is a small tear. So you see the uh, loss of this homogeneity. Some areas are uh, more uh, hypoechoic than others. So this is telling that something is happening here. And if the chair is massive, then we will see all the tendon becoming hypoechoic or uh, um, disappearing because, because this hypoechogenicity surrounded by this edema, usually the result is that the tendon is missing. You cannot see, you can see no more the tendon. It's, uh, the tendon with pathology loses the anisotropy because there is edema inside the fibers, so we lose the anisotropy. And of course, uh, sorry, uh, this is the image, okay? You can see here the central uh, tendon of the rectus femoris. You can see a uh, good definition of the boundaries. You can see uh, that it's hyperechoic and homogeneous. And see what happens if we follow distal. Then the tendon becomes thickened, hyperechoic, and disappears, surrounded by edema, okay? So this is the image of the characteristic uh, uh, tendon tear. And uh, if we want to see uh, the retraction, the loss of tension, then we need to do sometimes to understand better these uh, panoramic reconstructions, or sometimes take a look at some wavy aspect of the tendon that you can see here, okay? This wavy aspect and these small acoustic shadows you can see here, which are telling us that this is an, uh, an artifact uh, happens when it is um, rounded borders. So this is a, or a stump or a wavy tendon, okay, with these small acoustic shadows, okay? If you see an acoustic shadow inside the tendon without a calcification, then suspect a total tear. Okay. We have seen a general uh, definition or a general um, examples of uh, ruptures of the muscular tissue and connective tissue and now we are going to see some clinic examples, some examples in the hamstrings and in the rectus femoris. And let's start with the hamstrings. You can see all these types of injuries in hamstrings, but we, are we will focus on the principal and the main ones, okay? So these four types of injuries. And we will begin with the complete avulsion, the complete hamstring avulsion. We'll place the probe over the ischial velocity here. And we will identify the hamstring's origin. So this is the ischial tuberosity, this is the conjoint tendon, and this, is, this will be the um, same rosus tendon. And we will follow these tendons distally. And you will see how we follow the tendons, and then suddenly they disappear, just right there. So this is a complete rupture of the hamstrings. And this void is filled with hematoma, as you can see here. And more distally, then the distal muscle appears. Okay? You will understand better these images in the long axis. You can see the ischial tuberosity. And as we go distal, you will see this hematoma filling the void. Okay? And distally, the distal stump, the retraction of the, these tendons. In this, this is the image of the MRI. And this is the panoramic reconstruction and you can see all this avulsion of the hamstrings and the huge hematoma. Okay, this is the avulsion with this big hematoma. Now, second case, a small tendon tear in, in, into the free tendon. Okay, so we will start again at the ischial tuberosity, as you can see here. Okay, and we will follow this. This is the ischial tuberosity, and this is the conjoint tendon. We are following this tendon and see what happens. As we go distal, here you can see, and you see how the tendon, at this side we have a normal tendon, but here there's some abogenicity, there's some hypoechoic area around the hypoechoic area, which is telling that something's happening here. This is a, sm a small tendon chair of the uh, free tendon or the conjoint tendon. So this is pretend tendon because there is no muscular portion of, of the bicep femoris. We are more proximal. So this is very close to the origin of these um, hamstrings. Okay? 
and in the MRI you can see here here this small small injury small tear inside this free tendon here if we go distal you will see the injury a little bit bigger okay and again this tendon is healthy is normal and this tendon is affected at this level and again in the MRI you can see in black the normal tendon and in gray or even a, a very very high intensity signal this is a tear inside the the the, the free tendon and we can follow distally and more distally then the tear becomes smaller and we still have a little bit here but it's getting uh, smaller and smaller the same injury in the long axis okay always we must check in both axes always okay and here you can see how the the deep part of the tendon has a fibular pattern and in the other side slightly more this is superficial you have the chair of the tendon and the loss of this fibular pattern now the conjoint tendon injury in this case we are going to see a, a, a bigger injury uh, with a total tear okay so we'll begin a little bit distal you here you can see there is no more free tendon because we are seeing this muscular component of the long head of the biceps and you can see that is some small I'm not sure something's happening here maybe not we will continue slightly distal and here we have a clear affection of this conjoint tendon okay you can see this hypochoic round uh, mass, uh, tendon sorry with loss of anisotropy and if we take a look at the MRI you can see here again this image of this tendon with this a small amount of connective tissue preserved but here a huge affection uh, more than the 50% of the total cross-sectional area if we continue slightly distal let's see what happens with this tendon then it disappears and even you can see this acoustic shadow here telling us that something has lost tension here that is surely some uh, waviness of the tendon this uh, don't 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 get wrong this is not the conjoint tendon this is the component of the semitendinosus uh, you will understand better in the MRI you can see here the component of the semitendinosus okay but this is the component of the uh, biceps femoris which uh, is no more there because it's a complete tear of this uh, conjoint tendon of this tendon in this case of the long held biceps Okay. And if you continue distal, then the normal tendon appears. Here you can see again hyperechoic, okay, with uh, the definition, the correct definition of the tendon. Okay. Again, we can turn the probe and see what happens in the long axis, and you will see this shadow wound here. Okay, this image, these shadows are telling us that this a waviness of the tendon, a loss of tension of the tendon, as you can see here in the MRI, okay, we have this image here, and you can see this retraction of the tendon, okay. And finally, the last one in the hamstrings, which is the uh, disconnective system affection. We can have several ones, but we are going to talk about the T-junction, which is very fancy now, okay because of its, um, the possibility of this high rate of re-injuries. We may have the affection of the long head, of the short head, or the affection of both heads at the same time, which, is, which are called the zipper injuries with the worst prognosis. We are going to take a look at the, this, these ones, and we are seeing the, this example. In this case, we can see the affection of the long head of the bicep. This is short head, this is long head. And you can see here the affection, the edema, sorry, in the long head, okay? The same is in the MRI. You can see here the edema in the long head. 
But we are going to see what happens as we go distal. Then you see that there is an hematoma, sorry, an edema in both heads. Okay? And even if we go slightly distal, you will see better this edema here. And you can see how the edema affects both the short head at this level and the long head at this level with uh, this, uh, the tendon be missing at this level. So again, you can see in the MRI the same images with the edema in the short head, in the long head, and the, the, um, this part of the T uh, disappeared. Okay? So this is the super, uh, classic zipper injury. As you can see, all this edema and this loss of the connective tissue. Okay, those were the, some injuries of the hamstrings. And now we are going to take a look to the injuries of the rectus femoris. Sorry. Here. Again, there are several possibilities. We are going to focus only in three of them. The direct tendon injuries, the myofascial injuries, and the septal injuries. Let's start with the direct tendon injuries. It's a pure tendinous injury. We are going to check the direct tendon, and the direct tendon origin is the anterior, anterior inferior iliac spine at this level. Okay, You will see at this level. And then we are going to move distally, in the short axis, and see what happens here. You can see the thicken of the direct tendon, okay? hypoechoic and thickened, like you can see in the MRI, hypoechoic and thickened, okay? with some edema at this level, okay? so maybe some partial tear at this level. So, so partial tear at this level. And a small amount of hematoma here, as you can see here. If we move up down, and we will see how this direct tendon that usually, that usually no, that as it goes distal will form the aponeurotic expansion of the rectus femoris. So it gets wide and covers the anterior side of the rectus femoris. So we should see a connective tissue, the less a, a hanechoic, sorry, hypo, hypo intense. Uh, signal here, a point is line here, and there is no this line, so because there is a total rupture of this uh, aponeurotic expansion. As you can see here, you can see the direct tendon here, and you can see the absence of this direct component here. Okay? We can see only hematoma. Maybe you'll understand better in the long axis, we are in the same place. So this is the anterior inferior iliac spine. This is the proximal direct tendon. But here you can see then that it's a void with some small amount of hematoma here. Okay, so this is the area of rupture of the direct tendon. And in the MRI, you can see here at this level, and here it continues, and then here, here it disappears. Okay, so the tendon gets injured. Myofascial injuries are a particular injuries located. Um, they, they are into the distal con uh, uh, connective system because the this distal connective system um, reaches a very proximal place. Uh, usually the um, posterior aponeurosis, as we go proximal, gets thin and thinner and thinner and is so thin that we cannot see no more with the ultrasound or MRI, but there's still a, a very, very thin line, which is the fascia covering the posterior side of the rectus femoris. Sometimes you will see edema and injury in between the muscle and this posterior fascia. The, that's why they are called myofascial injuries. And in this case, you can see the edema of the rectus femoris, like, like we will see an MRI, okay? And with this small rupture, okay, inside the muscle here, okay? telling us that there is some hematoma inside, okay? So this image is very similar in both in MRI or ultrasound. And if we turn the, the probe 90 degrees over this 
edema, you will see the characteristic edema called the feathery edema inside the muscle, both in MRI and in ultrasound. Okay, so very, very easy to see, and we can uh, have a very good view of this edema and these injuries with ultrasound and with MRI both. To finish the septal injuries, if we follow this central tendon of the rectus femoris and see what happens, like in this case, you have here, sorry, here, this is the rectus femoris, the central tendon of the rectus femoris. This is the final part of the sp aponeurotic expansion, you can see here, but you can see here the central tendon of the rectus femoris. We will follow this tendon, then puff, it suddenly disappears, gets thick, thickened and hypochoic, and this tells us that this is a complete rupture of this tendon. You can see here in the uh, ultrasound on this long axis, and you can see here the paramic reconstruction of this injury. In MRI, you can see here the complete tear with some amount of retraction and waviness of the tendon. Ultrasound guided procedures, of course, are very, very useful, and ultrasound gives us the precision and the, um, the safe guidance we need to perform uh, with huge security. So uh, now we can perform these procedures very, very well. This is a clinical case that Dr. Pelret gave me. So this is not my, my patient, but it's not the same case as these images. Okay. So this is a patient who, well, you can may have these huge hematomas clinically, but sometimes you, uh, these uh, hematomas are um, deep and are um, very encapsulated, so no, not so clear from outside. So in this case, you can see here this rupture of the hamstrings with this huge hematoma, okay, deep to the semitendinosus, okay, and the rupture and the retraction of the semimembranosus. This is the paramic reconstruction where you can see that the uh, semitendinosus has some amount of um, of origin still at his place, but the semimembranosus is totally broken and retracted. Okay, so it's destroyed this mass. And if we let this injury um, evolve without draining, without taking out this uh, hematoma, then usually very uh, big scars, very fibrotic scars develop and will cause discomfort in the future to the patient. And also this hematoma can uh, irritate the sciatic nerve and uh, uh, provoke these uh, hamstring uh, syndromes with this neuritis of the, uh, of the sciatic nerve. So uh, as long as we can get this uh, fibrotic scar uh, more um, smaller, and then surely it will have a better prognosis. We can, uh, uh, we can drain use usually a, a huge amount of uh, hematoma and you can see here the results in the uh, ultrasound after the procedure are very very good so finally ultrasound or mri ultrasound has uh, can detect hematoma very well and um, moderate to severe tendon injuries so it's a, a useful technique especially after a first, for a first evaluation after injury, because uh, um, we will have this uh, machine uh, at the side of the field, very close to the, um, to the player. So the first technique we usually use in the Athletic de Bilbao is uh, ultrasound. Once we have this, um, this first diagnosis, we use ultrasound to um, and perform weekly controls and when the patient feels uncomfortable on some evolution, clinical evolution is not as good as expected. So again, for the first um, rule out of complications, we will use ultrasound. And of course, for guide procedures, of course, we use ultrasound. When we use MRI, when we have a mild to say, sorry, a moderate to severe injury, we always um, add MRI to have a better definition of the connective tissue involved because um, it is related with uh, the risk of re-injury and the prognosis and always we need to have a plan on how, uh, how many weeks will the patient 
be out of uh, game. So this first uh, assessment, as good as possible, requires the MRI. When we have some patient complaining of, uh, in, of pain and we don't see anything with ultrasound, then we always perform an MRI because uh, for small injuries in the tendon, sometimes uh, ultrasound is lacks of sensitivity. So in these cases, we must be sure and we'll ask for MRI. Uh, in deep injuries like suspicion in uh, injuries of the indirect tendon, um, we usually uh, perform MRI because even if we see something with the ultrasound, uh, the image in the MRI will be better. And finally, in severe injuries, when we want to follow, uh, we suspect that it may be some immature scar, then to make this evaluation of the maturation of the scar, we will need MRI because ultrasound is not specific enough to uh, assess these, these aspects. No? So, answering to, your, to the question, MRI or ultrasound, what is the best for uh, muscle injuries? I, I think that nowadays you need to have both. Both are complementary, both give us uh, very, very useful information and both are uh, fundamental. So I usually recommend both. Thank you very much. I hope you like it.